made the very first scientific observation about it, that it was not formed on a fault or some fracture in the ground, but rather when he looked at both sides of the river, he saw that the strata were conformable with one another and that it was erosion that created the Grand Canyon, water erosion. So no matter how big the canyon was, it was still cut by erosion. And that's basically one of the few things that we can say is an absolute truth for the Grand Canyon today. A lot of you will have heard of this man, John Wesley Powell. He received a lot of accolades for his two river trips down the Grand Canyon. And in 1869, he completed a 101-day trip, which went from Wyoming to Nevada. You can imagine a trip that long. Now, when he got to this place in the Grand Canyon on his first trip, the photographs are only from the second trip, but when he got to this place on the first trip, he was already in a race for survival to beat the clock. They had lost a lot of their food, and they had lost a boat up in Utah, and they were just racing through it. But he did say some things about the Green River, which he came through earlier in the trip. And here we are in the very northern part of Utah on the Green River, and you can see the river coming in at the top on the left. And it makes this 90-degree turn and flows past the photographer there. And if you turn around 180 degrees from this spot, that's what happens to the river at this spot. It goes right into that uplifted mountain. Now, this is the same thing the Grand Canyon, does, uh, the Colorado River does in the Grand Canyon. So Powell said something about this. He, did, he didn't say it specifically about the Grand Canyon. So just to show you those two pictures again, there's an open valley at Brown's Hole, but a closed canyon in an area called Lador. Why does the river do this? And Powell needed to explain it. So this is what he did. He invented a process known as antecedents, which means that the river was in its channel before the mountains were created. And you can look at the first diagram there. You see a river just flowing across a very subdued landscape. And then through time, the crust is squeezed, and a mountain range forms slowly enough that it doesn't deflect the river, and the river keeps its course and chisels the canyon down in there. And this was the idea for the formation of many of the canyons along the Colorado River in Powell's day. And in fact, these ideas were not challenged for about 40 or 50 years. Now, next came Clarence Dutton, and he had just a little bit of an uh, addition to make to antecedents. Uh, what Clarence Dutton is known for is his incredible writing style as a scientist, but also he brought the very first artist that would come and look at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> And this was a man named William Henry Holmes. And uh, you can see those little people on horseback in the lower left there, that water hole. Look at this landscape behind here in the western part of the Grand Canyon. These were some of the first times that members of Congress back in Washington, D.C. could see images of what the western landscape looked like. And Clarence Dutton uh, brought this man out there. This was his idea called superposition. You'll notice that the river in the top diagram starts out just like it did for antecedents, although Dutton was saying that the river started flowing out over young sediments, very loose silt and sands from a lake deposit. And as that river cut down and cut away those soft deposits, it gave you what you see down there in the lower diagram, where the river is still going through mountains, but it just was laid down into a very pre-existing topography. And this was a very, very nice explanation for what we see. And the truth of the matter is that the river we see today, even in the Grand Canyon, might be a combination of these two processes. There were other geologists that came along. G.K. Gilbert is a very big name in, in Western geology. C.D. Walcott built the Nankoweek Trail and also had the distinction of being the first Grand Canyon geologist without facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> And then Elliot Blackwelder came along in the 1920s. He was a professor at, uh, at Yale, and he did some field work out west. And this was the first man to overtly challenge the theory of antecedents. He looked at the landscape, and what he saw was a very, very young river at Canyon. And this was very different than what Powell thought. If Powell's idea of antecedents were to be true, that means the Colorado River had to be older than the mountains around it. And geologists started to see evidence that the mountains were created 60 million years ago. So Elliot Blackwell was one of the first people to ever academically challenge John Wesley Powell. That took a lot of guts to do that, because John Wesley Powell was the god. Now this was uh, Blackwell's idea. His idea was that as the glaciers would occasionally melt up in Wyoming and Colorado, 
all of that meltwater would come down the river channel and then form these lakes. The first one you can see there is where the Glen Canyon area is. And then that lake would fill up to its brim, overflow at the lowest spot, and then start to fill in another lake. And then that lake would fill up and fill right to its brim, and then spill over and flow into another place. You can see five different lakes here. This was kind of the idea that Elliot Blackwelder that Welder came up with, and a very unique idea for his day. Not too many people bought into it because he challenged Powell, and that wasn't a nice thing to do. But believe it or not, this is actually a very, very good theory that has received some modern accolades. And I'll tell you about that in just a few minutes. Chester Longwell came along in the 1930s, and he had the really good fortune of making a geologic map of all the areas that would be flooded by Lake Mead. The reason he was very lucky about that is because when the lake flooded everything, nobody could go back and prove that his ideas were wrong. <laughs> but of course, we now know living in the drought of the first part of the 21st century here that a lot of his deposits have come back to the surface. The government sent a lot of geologists out to the Hoover Dam area and they did that so that they could see what was going to be buried by the reservoir. And in the course of running around, Chester Longwell went to the mouth of the Grand Canyon. And this is the mouth of the Grand Canyon right there. You can kind of see the river in a lake form here coming out of that cliff. That is the very, very end of the Grand Canyon right there. But I want to draw your attention to these low hills in the bottom of the photograph. That's called the Muddy Creek Formation. And the Muddy Creek Formation is a gravel that was as young as six million years, but not one speck of that gravel came out of the Grand Canyon. And this is where the six million year old date comes from for the age of the Colorado River. So I'm talking about all those rounded hills in the bottom of the photograph and in the middle of the photograph. It's full of gravel and silt and sand, and not one bit of it from the Colorado River. So what this told Chester Longwell is that the Colorado River could not be flowing out of the Grand Wash Cliffs before six million years ago, and that means the river probably wasn't in existence at that time. And that's where this date comes from, it's from Chester Longwell and other people that worked after him. Well, I hate to confuse the story, but in the 1950s, Charlie Hunt came along. And Charlie Hunt had a much different view because when he made a map of the Colorado River way up in the state of Colorado, you can see on the far right there, he had evidence that the Colorado River within the state of Colorado was 30 million years old. And when you think about it now, we've got a little bit of a problem. How can a, a, the river that Blackwelder and Longwell saw be young while Hunt had evidence for the old river. How could a single river be two different ages? It just didn't make sense. So somebody had to come to the rescue. And that man was Eddie McKee, who was a very famous geologist in northern Arizona and did a lot of things for our area here. Here you see him as a young man in the 1930s at the dinosaur tracks near Moanabe. But Eddie McKee had a long and colorful career until he passed away in 1986. And in 1964, he convened a symposium at the Museum of Northern Arizona, and 20 geologists were in attendance. And this is the cover of the booklet that was put out three years later called The Evolution of the Colorado River in Arizona. And I'm going to show you graphically now one of the major ideas that they came up with, because this talks about the idea for how a river could be old in one place, but young in another. And we're looking at a digital elevation map of the entire Grand Canyon here. You can see the Grand Wash Cliffs over there on the far left, and you can also see Lake Powell in the upper right. This is the entire Grand Canyon right here. And what Eddie McKee and his colleagues eventually said from the symposium is that the river started out as two separate rivers that eventually became integrated into the one river we see today. Their old river, the, the, the river on the east, came out of Utah, and that's how they could have uh, um, agree with Charlie Hunt that the river was old in the state of Colorado. And instead of going through the Grand Canyon, they went in the course of the Little Colorado River and was deflected to the southeast. Now the reason that older river would be deflected there is because there was a drainage divide, which I've located here with this yellow line. And so the river would come out of Utah, according to their view, and then travel in the channel of the Little Colorado and then eventually out 
to the Gulf of, of Mexico. A, a concurrent with this idea was that the rest of the Grand Canyon was formed by another river which had a much steeper gradient and could lengthen its channel in the upstream direction. So you see which direction the arrow is pointing. That's the way the water flows in that younger drainage. But that drainage through time progressively lengthened its channel in the upstream direction. And eventually, you know what's going to happen. It's going to eat its way through that yellow line and capture the river illustrated there by the blue arrows. 